My name's Gary Fleming. I'm a 37-year-old Republican. I come from the Waterside area of Derry. I'm married to Kathleen and I have seven children. My name's Maureen Shields. I'm 25 years old and married with three children. I live in the Bogside area of Derry City, which is in the north of Ireland. My name's Donna Bradley. I live in Derry. I'm married with three children. I was married before to an IRA volunteer. He was shot dead by the SAS in May 1981. My name is Raymond McCartney. I am 39 years old. I am a Republican activist. I have been provisionally released from a life sentence after serving 17 and a half years. I was convicted in a deadlock court of killing two people. The Prime Minister has said his government would be imaginative in its response to an IRA ceasefire. Speaking during a visit to Belfast, John Major said any move that stopped the violence would be welcomed by everyone. The headlines this Wednesday morning. All indications suggest the IRA will later on today call a permanent ceasefire. For peace. But fire is coming cannot be doubted. After According to reliable sources, should begin at midnight tonight. In Belfast, an anxious tension on the streets with rumours of a ceasefire. After 25 years of violence and 3,000 deaths, the IRA have declared their most significant ceasefire to date. It takes place from midnight tonight. It, it was a time of, of, uh, of fear. There was reservations. Was it the right thing to do? Was it the right time to do it? Um, and of course there was, there was the, the whole scenario of, of how the Loyalists would interpret uh, that particular announcement. By and large, people welcomed the thing. Uh, I welcomed it myself, along with my family. It was, uh, it was a good sign. It was a sign that uh, things had moved forward. Um, I was in the rocking chair that night and the band that was playing, they had a countdown at 12 o'clock. The ceasefire was starting at 12, so the band had a, a countdown at 12 and everybody was standing up cheering and shouting and all happy and of course everybody was happy but I just cried. I think it was very emotional for me. Um, everybody here was celebrating but I know that we all had cause to celebrate, but I just couldn't help but think, Pop's not here, he can't see it, it's too late for him. The next statement in the next few minutes was, the IRA would like to congratulate their volunteers and uh, thank them, and I just burst under tears, really burst under tears, and looked at my children and thought, Jesus, it's over. And then as the day went on, I came to about, and I talked to friends about the ceasefire, and do you know what he's think, what he's think, and, and it was all the same feelings as me. Didn't really know, unsure, couldn't put their finger on exactly what they were feeling, if they were feeling relief, or if they were feeling confident. Um, it was the same thing. Speaking in London this morning, the Prime Minister, Mr John Major, welcomed the IRA ceasefire. However, he said that just a little more was needed from the IRA before Sinn Féin could become properly involved. I think Bloody Sunday had a, a big effect on my life. And like a lot of men and boys of, of our age, we decided then that possibly we should be doing something about the British presence in Ireland. So about a month after Bloody Sunday, I approached uh, a very senior Republican in Derry and I asked him and, and actually told him what my thoughts were. And he told me that this wasn't uh, the, the time for a motion uh, to cloud a very important judgment. So he told me to go away and think about it and think about it long. And I remained as it was coming near the time 
have actually been accepted as a member. There was a volunteer shot dead, and I remember the person taking the lectures actually saying to me, what do you when you leave here tonight? They go to that volunteer's house and look at him in a sort of, in, in the wake house, because that's, that's what the IRA can lead to. So I remember going on again, like, you know, you go in and you do see the, you see the family and you see a young man lying dead, but despite it all, I mean, I still felt that these things had been worked out in my head, and I believed that the IRA was the only group who were resisting British rule in such a way that you're going to create change. And I decided then to, to join the IRA. Well, I think being a Catholic, maybe from my point of view, I take it a very selfish point of view. I use the faith when needed. Um, it's for this grotto here in this chapel. This we needed this. The time of the Gilmore trial, we were out on a run, just a day out, and we came across this by chance. And we come in and we said a prayer here. Um, I had a lot of relatives all involved with the Supergrass trial, all in jail at the time. And we said novena here at the Grotto and promised we would come back if ever our request was granted. And um, Supergrass did fall apart and we've been coming back ever since. So really I think being a Catholic to me is having God there when we need him. Maybe it's selfish but still being a Catholic, it's still our faith and we, when we need our faith it's there for us. British security forces have closed border roads which were reopened by locals in the wake of the IRA ceasefire. The Taoiseach Albert Reynolds has said British soldiers should be withdrawn to their barracks in the north as part of the continuing peace process. Speaking during a trip to Philadelphia, Mr Reynolds also said any prospect of a loyalist ceasefire would be welcomed by his government and all the people of Ireland. Now the Loyalist gunmen match the IRA ceasefire. Peace in Northern Ireland from midnight. That's the Loyalists now. They've called their ceasefire. So a lot of people sleep easier in bed at night, I think. Maybe that put an end to all these sectarian murders. And it's great for the people of Belfast especially. Um, it was inevitable anyway that they would call the ceasefire at the end of the day if the IRA had laid down their guns, who are they supposed to be fighting? If there's nobody else with guns in the streets now, only the Brits, and if they want to be British, there's no point in them fighting with the Brits if that's what they want to be themselves. They're only fighting with their own side, so maybe now we'll have really some kind of a lasting peace now. I think now that the ceasefire's called and Everybody's kind of reminiscing now over the years and everything that we've been through. And we've been through a lot. I, I know from when I was a child, my family have been through a lot and we've had a lot of hurts, a lot of pain. And I think the worst thing ever that the Brits really have done to me, I know they've killed Pop and they've imprisoned a lot of my family, but I think the time that I was sitting one night watching the, the news and it just flashed up on the screen this photograph of a man, an SAS man, and they said this was the man that had shot Pop in the Brandywell and they gave a whole reconstruction of the shooting incident. And it just took me by surprise that this is the actual man that killed him. Yeah, you know, you're, I was coming face to face with him, I couldn't believe it. And his wife, he had been killed himself. And his wife and daughter, he had a daughter just the same as Pop had a wife and daughter, and they were in Buckingham Palace receiving a medal. I, I thought that this wasn't fair. I mean, war is war, and there's going to be casualties, and I accepted that Pop was a soldier and he was out fighting, and I accepted that he died in action. But I don't think that they needed to gloat, it over, gloat over his death, giving out medals for killing somebody. At the end of the day, I mean, uh, even when a policeman or a, a British soldier shot, they have a family too, and I definitely wouldn't gloat over their death because I know myself what I've been through. Go on, Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to Jane! Happy birthday to you! My 
I see Larkin walking in the room. Um, I think, Jesus, you know, I really want things to change. I want things to be different. I don't want my son to have to grow up with what I had to grow up with or what my friends had to grow up with. Um, I mean, I, I want things to be so much different. I want things to be so positive for him. I want him to grow up and say, I mean, you never know, he might become a policeman. He loves uh, ambulances and fire brigades and, and police cars. He loves the ball. But uh, obviously, the existing uh, police force would need to change. I mean, he just loved the events of Halloween. He understood it so much more this year. But for me, it was that um, insecure feeling. And then you're going out the front door and you sort of hit with the reality of these are your streets and this is your community. And there's that sort of um, shaky thing, shaky feeling that has been here where you're looking to the future and you're wanting to see uh, a better place to live in. You're wanting to see uh, jobs and better housing and a better situation, no trips on your street for your children. And then you're walking down the town and you're meeting people who are dressed as uh, RUC officers or British Army soldiers um, or IRA men, you know, big black balaclavas and all the rest of it. And they're all having a grand giggle and a grand laugh. And, and, and you sort of think, well, I mean, you know, this should all sort of look funny. It should all look humorous. It's Halloween and the, the spirit of the thing is that everybody's having a bit of crack. But then you turn the corner and you're, you're met with armoured RUC jeeps, big jeeps, obviously. They're not part of the fancy dress. And you're met with real RUC officers and your heart sort of sinks again. And it just made me stand back, look around, look at the fireworks, see everything and think, well, I mean, are the British, is this, is this what the ceasefire is like? Is it like this big false fist being put on the whole situation? You know, are they dressing it up? Are they giving all these wee cosmetic changes? Everybody else is running around with makeup on them and false faces. Is that what the British are trying to do with our lives living here on the streets of Derry? Uh, I'm doing an MA course on peace and conflict studies. Uh, obviously, a number of people have known me when they ask you what you're studying and you mention peace and conflict studies, if the, the jokes abound. But basically, the course covers all aspects of conflict resolution. And putting on a personal basis, obviously, it has been very enlightening, particularly in the present phase of, of this conflict. And I think the British would uh, learn a lot of lessons if they come to some of the classes uh, as and how other conflict situations sat down and worked out uh, a way forward in their own particular peace processes. I've actually, this, this is, I've actually seen this advertisement um, a few times now. Uh, it's very, it's very annoying. It's like all these symbols of uh, where we are. I mean, we haven't even got to that stage. We haven't even got to the starting blocks yet. Um, it's like it's, it's showing the RUC as some sort of normal, acceptable police force in the community. And that's for this. Ballard's turning into flowers. I mean, what's next? The Rosemount Tower turning into a helter-skelter or the Strand Road Barracks turned on the big bouncy castle. Um, it's like, you, you can't do that, you know, you can't, you can't put advertisements like this on the TV which are showing that the situation, that they've, they've made progress, they haven't. I mean, the talks haven't even started yet. Um, so for me, uh, I, I, they, can't sh they can't tell me that the RUC are now acceptable for my child to be lost in a marketplace and him or her to walk up and say, uh, who's your mommy? and my child give them their mommy's name or their daddy's name. I mean, in reality, if that has ever happened here, my child has been faced with a, bu a torrent of abuse about his or her father, and that's just not acceptable. You know, it's not acceptable for me. Uh, like, like, just last night, I had a very, what, what you would call a humbling experience, because uh, sometimes 
uh, when you're released, you know, there's certain values and certain things that you appreciate. Last night I was in the, the city hospital visiting Paul Kinsella. Paul Kinsella is a, is a dairy man. Uh, he was sentenced to eight years in, 18 years imprisonment a number of months ago. And then about six or seven weeks ago, he, uh, he was moved to city hospitals suffering from leukemia. There's been a, a number of people uh, involved in trying to articulate the need for his release. And for the first number of weeks, he was under, under guard. And during his treatment, uh, he contacted an infection. And now he's been moved in the intensive care unit because his he's, uh, immune system has been eroded. And he now has a severe uh, bout of, of pneumonia. And, and watching him last night uh, just sort of made me realise that, you know, that, that his own strength, a, a man now fighting for his life and the, and the strength of his family. And, and it's those type of experiences that m makes you realise just, you know, the, the battles that, that, that families fight all the time, support of their loved ones. And for me last night it was a, a, an experience that will that live long with me. British government officials are to have a formal meeting with Sinn Féin representatives. This meeting comes less than a year after John Major said that any meeting with Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams would disgust him. Well, the talks are beginning in Stormont today. Um, I, I just don't know why this didn't happen 25 years ago. Um, well, it didn't happen because Britain said no. Britain said they wouldn't talk to any representative of Sinn Féin who supported the IRA while they were in their armed struggle. I mean, it took a ceasefire. If they had did this 25 years ago, then Irish people and British people wouldn't have lost their lives. Um, I mean, I just hope that the British delegates turn up today in that room with the same desire for peace and change, and the same feeling of creating an Ireland where everyone can live in peace, not divided, but together. I mean, my thoughts are with Sinn Féin, but my eyes are in Britain. Well, at least it's a start. Uh, preliminary talks have, have begun. Uh, the, the, one of the major obstacles of, of uh, actually getting to sit down officially, a Sinn Féin delegation talking to a British delegation, is out of the way. Uh, it's been hailed as, as a, an historic day, um, but it's probably only going to be the first of quite a few preliminary meetings before uh, the uh, the major negotiations are embarked upon, and I think that's what that's what you, where we really have to um, focus on the the, uh, the the proper full uh, full blown negotiations. Besides the peace process, one of the biggest events that, that's happening for me this year is uh, my youngest sister, in the last in the house is getting married, so I've been asked to do bridesmaid, so I'm going up to get that uh, bridesmaid for it this week for the dress. Move the, the best man stand here. Right. Okay, got that. Where are the small children going? Move the small children just to the one side for two seconds. Just you know, side, sideline them just there. Okay. Then uh, I've just come back from, from visiting Paul and his condition appears to be worsening. Uh, there's two contrasting thoughts in my mind. One is the absolute sort of strength, courage and grace of Cathy, his wife, and the rest of his family. And this is contrasted with a sort of uh, the total inhumanity of the people who continue to hold him instead of releasing him uh, to land be with his family and, his, and what may be his sort of last living hours. There's been a call to release convicted IRA man Paul Kinsella because of his failing health. Raymond McCartney, spokesperson for the Republican Prisoners Support Group Searsha, has called on the government and prison authorities to show compassion and release Kinsella, who has been diagnosed... Paul Kinsella has died. Uh, my immediate thoughts go to his wife, Cathy, his daughter, Michaela, and the rest of her family. Despite realising the seriousness of his illness, news of his death has shocked me. We are now waiting at the top of the flyover, which is a traditional spot where Republicans will gather to meet his body coming home from Belfast. Once the coffin reaches here, 
flag will be placed on the coffin and his burying gloves will be placed on top of the flag. Our brother Paul has gone to his rest in the peace of Christ. May the Lord now welcome him to the table of God's children in heaven with faith and hope in eternal life. Let us assist him with our prayers. Let us pray to the Lord also for ourselves. May we who mourn be reunited one day with our brother Paul. Together may we meet Christ Jesus when he who is our life appears in glory. As we bury here the body of our brother Paul, deliver him from his soul from every bond of sin, that he may rejoice in you with your saints forever. Sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother Paul, that we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's Christmas Eve and we're just getting ready to play Santa. All the children are in bed and they're really excited and, and I'm excited as well. But I can't stop thinking that today that there are people missing, that there are fathers who should be with their children, that there are mothers who should be with their children, and they're not. The ceasefire happened in August, and this is now December, and we still haven't seen the release of political prisoners. There's a more relaxed mood. Um, people generally up here to be uh, preparing themselves for a sort of a war-free Christmas. And, you know, hopefully that will be the case, but there, there's always the underlying uh, notions there that, while there might actually be no conflict, uh, no open conflict this Christmas, that all of the, um, the underlying causes of the conflict are still there and have yet to be dealt with. People will probably be faced with a harsh reality come January. Uh, but in saying that, you know, why not enjoy Christmas without war for the uh, first time in 20 odd years? There's usually a, a smaller, it's, it's more a ceremony than, than anything, uh, where the families, it's usually just around the families and, and other people, you know, close to families come. And I went there with my mother and father and I met a, a number of my cousins and, and their brother Jim was one of those murdered that day by the paratroopers. And it, it, no, no, matter, no matter when I think about uh, Bloody Sunday, I always remember how how that family, who were, were a united family that day at that march, how, if you like, these people you know, broke into that unity and, and, and smashed it forever. And I, I can remember the, the three days of, of the week, and you just were, were a very, very close observer. I was young, I was only about 17 at the time, but you were a very close observer. They have family totally and absolutely fragmented. Uh, that, that one of their brothers, one of their sort of dear ones had been taken away from them. And the family, you know, despite being a very close family over the years, they were never going to be the same because Jim, Jim was away. And it's that type of thing that always, I always remember. And I'd always remem remember then that, that that's what grief is about. Grief is, is what's left behind when a family 
are sort of, if you like, their unity is taken away from them. We want to see a process of forgiveness, of reconciliation. And I have acknowledged publicly the hurt which Republicans have inflicted. I have acknowledged that as have, all, as have others. But the unionists also must acknowledge the hurt which they have inflicted and the loyalists and especially the British government. Uh, everybody afterwards was, was really impressed by the size of the crowd. I mean, people were actually talking about it in the same size as the original Bloody Sunday March in 1972. Uh, from a personal point of view, it was, it was brilliant to see uh, hundreds of ex-prisoners coming from Belfast, uh, Dundalk, South Armagh, Tyrone, Strabane, everywhere. Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's great because it's like a bit of crack although the, the, the day is a very poignant day, but it's, it's good to get that sort of comradeship, renew oil friendships, a wee bit of banter and a wee bit of scale, a wee bit of gossip. And afterwards I went, we went down to the house and there was again a number of ex-prisoners and just over a cup of tea before you'd say your, your farewells for God knows how long. You know, it's just that whole feeling of solidarity. Unionist politicians have been angered by the former Secretary of State, Peter Brook. Mr Brook described the Sinn Féin President, Jerry Adams, as a brave and courageous man. The Sinn Féin President, Jerry Adams, declined to comment on Mr Brook's remarks, but he called on the British government to show courage and bravery in its handling of the peace process. We're on our way now to Port Leash to visit Fiona's husband, John. He's a political prisoner there. We've been through the Achnacloy checkpoint now. It's not manned. Usually it would be manned and we'd have a lot of hassle. Thank God. We're straight through. I've, I've been watching with interest over the past number of weeks the speculation about the, uh, the content of the framework document and the, the threats coming from unionism about what they will and will not do should A, B or C be contained within that document. And then uh, yesterday in, in, the, in the London Times, there was the uh, the, the inspired or, or conspired leak of the content of that document, and it's quite obvious that uh, we we have deliberate attempts here to, to thwart the whole peace process to prevent the uh, the roundtable negotiations. Even, even beginning, and uh, you know the nationalist people in, in the six counties have, have seen all of this before, and and they know, and they c they can read the signs. And what we have here is the unionists behaving like children with a dental appointment. You know they'll put up every obstacle before they'll, they'll go and, and and get the necessary done. But I think. Um, What's going to have to happen is that they have to be dragged to, to the table the same way a child is, is, is dragged to the dentist. And they, and they may realise that the, uh, the treatment after all wasn't so bad. In Belfast today, the British and Irish Prime Ministers have unveiled the framework document. As people digest the document, comments have varied, from unionists calling it a sellout to nationalists claiming it's a start. We're just after coming out of Port Leash Prison. We wanted a film going into the prison, but the authorities refused us. They wouldn't even let us f f uh, film anywhere even near the, the prison. So we're just going to head home now, and um, five-hour journey ahead of us now. Long run. Well, in the midst of all the turmoil, uh, that's a phone call now. I have to go up and get measured for my suit for my wedding. So I have to phone now my brother Andrew and make, and make arrangements. Uh, it's 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 ironic in the middle sometimes if like you don't know where you are it is. You no, know, everything's up and down and you're turned about, but in the middle of all I'm trying to organise things for a wedding. So this is an hour part of it now, I'm gonna have to get measured for the suit, so I'll have to leave you. 
Come on, Dak, get it off her, right here. Come on. This will be what you're in for. Probably up down. Come on, leave following us. All right. I should not be. Give it to me. Three guesses. An eight. Hey! Elsie, Mommy, Elsie. Where was it, see? Says Tech Room. Bubba. An eight. Several of, of, of my own family have been in prison, some of them twice. Uh, at times, others have, have not been able to stay at home for various reasons. And um, ten years ago, in uh, 1984, we lost a brother uh, during a, an IRA operation. Himself and, a, and another comrade were, were killed by uh, the SAS. But uh, we don't continue in struggle as a, as a means to avenge any of the wrongs done in the past, we, uh, we continue and struggle to end the wrongs of the past and the wrongs of the present and to make sure that there won't be any in the future. The Republican leadership extends seasonal and fraternal greetings to its activists, supporters and friends at home and abroad. To our imprisoned comrades in Ireland, England, Europe and America and to their families, we extend warm greetings and continued solidarity. As we commemorate the 79th anniversary... I was 18 going on 19 when I met Pop. And, well, Pop, I call him Pop, that's his nickname. His proper name is Charles Maguire. And we were 19 going on 20 when we got married. We were only married a short while. And Claire was just a baby when Pop was killed. Um, so we were just a short time together, but it was a happy time. I think grief and loneliness after death is the same for everybody. I remember after Pop died, uh, myself and my friend went to Paris. When we came back, her husband was at the bus step awaiting in her. And it just hit me then again, the loneliness. There was no one there for me. I have since remarried. And thank God I was lucky enough to find somebody who is understanding towards my situation. And he also has no interest in politics, which suits me. He doesn't mind Claire talking about her father. He doesn't mind me speaking to Claire about her father. And he thinks it's only but right that Claire keeps her, her own identity. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's meant to Margaret, my granny Jean. Right, that's my daddy there. And that's Peggy. He was shot the mum and my daddy, but he loved. That's my godfather, and he done life imprisonment after it, after my daddy was killed. You call it the law, we call it apartheid, internment, conscription, partition, and silence. It's a law that they make to keep you and to be where they think we belong. They hide behind steel and bullets through glass machine guns and spies. And they tell us who suffered the tear gas and torture, the tweer and the run. No time for love if they come in the morning. No time to show tears or for fears in the morning. No time for goodbye and no time to ask why. 
Today sees the arrival of the British Prime Minister John Major to Londonderry. Various protest groups from throughout the city are expected to lobby the Prime Minister as he attends the Tower Museum. There have been some suggestions in the media and, and by some politicians that the events that afternoon were pre-planned and orchestrated by Sinn Féin. Well, I was one of the people who helped organise the Sinn Féin demonstration that day, and I was here with my wife and two of my children, one of them who was two-year-old, which are hardly the actions of someone who was planning a riot. It's Friday the 5th of May, it's 10.30 a.m. I'm in the Sinn Féin Centre in Craigan. Uh, from 7 o'clock this morning to 9 o'clock, the RUC have arrested over a dozen people in Derry and have charged them with a number of offences, uh, ranging from riders' behaviour to assault. Uh, as predicted yesterday, uh, we were expecting this. This is the, the RUC now trying to justify the actions which they took and the Guildhall Square and Union Hall Street when they forcibly removed peaceful pickets from the front of the Tower Museum. Uh, <clears throat> the, the RUC have visited my home. I, I wasn't at home at the time, so I'm not sure exactly what they're looking to do. Uh, I, I expect that they will uh, charge me with uh, similar offences to what the other people have been charged with. And as this program will know, uh, because they followed me throughout that day, I took part in a legitimate and very peaceful protest, and this is the RUC fighting back. Well, we're sat here in the Galvin Hospital, Ward 10, because for a week now, I've had um, a tummy, bu tummy bug, which is vampiring diarrhea, um, working its way through all of the children. Um, Dervla was brought in last night because she hasn't drank or been able to eat for, for um, over 48 hours, so there was a possible dehydration there. Um, I just feel totally shattered because I've been up. Sorry, honey. I know, darling, I know. I know. I just feel exhausted because we've been up all night. We haven't had any sleep. And it's now that you feel, <coughs> I'm feeling both the stress of my illness and um, the pressure of the three children being sick. Um, and in the midst of all that, not being able, you know, to get out and get to protests as much as you would like to. You, you, you feel the pressure with everything that's going on at the minute. Um, and, and obviously you sort of think that you know that your priority is your, you know, is your children and being with your children. So I've been missing a lot of this week's events. <laughs> It's time for equality. It's time to come to the negotiating table. It's time to stop hiding behind the unionists. And it's time for the unionists to stop hiding behind their fears and come out and face us like men and women and talk and negotiate and discuss a resolution of this conflict. <laughs> Speak to Michael Antrim at 11.30 tomorrow morning. I will 
say to him, Michael, it's make your mind up time. <laughs> A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. When Pentecost Day came around, the Apostles had all met in one room, when suddenly they heard what sounded like a powerful wind from heaven, the noise of which filled the entire house in which they were sitting. And something appeared to them that seemed like tongues of fire. They separate. Do you want to say anything, Liam? Say it's your day? Mm hmm? Are well, we going to get you ready? You feeling holy? Yeah. You feeling holy? Do you know everything you have to do? Say? All right? Good. All right. Well, uh, today I'm finally getting to attend uh, one of my boys' first communions. That's Liam here. Um, he's my fifth son. They are four. All of their first communions I've either been in prison or living away from home and couldn't attend. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this and um, hope it'll be a good day. I'm afraid this is as far as we go. We're not allowed to follow within the, the church. In this period, when people are talking about the need to release prisoners, it perhaps is inappropriate to talk about my own personal situation. As a life sentence prisoner, I am now home and I enjoy that freedom, but I am not officially released. In essence, what that means is that I have to go to the Cromwell Road prison every fortnight. Uh, two days ago, the two men who went on the workout scheme with me uh, were given their license. A license to, uh, to a life sentence prisoner is tantamount to release. Uh, the NIO told me that I wouldn't be getting my license at this stage because of the, the, the pending John Major case. As I pointed out to my solicitor, in their letter they clearly state that no further action would be taken. I feel that they are taking action by not giving me my license. Uh, my solicitor agrees with me and he's pursuing it along those lines and obviously I'll try and take it up with the NIO myself. Exactly. What I'll do, Raymond, is I'll write to the Northern Ireland Office on your behalf, indicating that you would dispute any charge that has been brought against you. You haven't received any summons as yet, of course. No, no. They've obviously received information from the REC that you are to be summoned or that a summons has been issued. But uh, I, would, I would write to them indicating that you are disputing any charges that may be brought against you and that you were not guilty of disorderly behaviour and you'll be contesting the matter in court and that you haven't broken any of the conditions of your release at this stage because the number seven would appear to be the relevant. Going down to visit the checkpoint, a uh, symbol of all the horrible things that have happened here for the past 25 years, one of, one of the, uh, the so-called cosmetic changes that, that the British government have decided to change here. Very, very small in what really needs to happen. But they've decided that they'll close it down, that uh, there will be no more personnel there. So it's just that, uh, you know, driving down to this thing, it brings back all those memories of um, being a child. You know, when you thought, oh, God, we're going to the beach, we're going to the beach. And you're 10 minutes down the road and you're pulled out at this... You, you stop at the checkpoint, you know, you're, and you hear your father and your mother talking about God. I wonder what these boys is going to be saying today. Are we going to be held long today? And uh, it just, it just became, you know, most people would get under the car and think, oh, great, sand, sun, sand castles, beach, rock, candy floss. You get under the car and you think, sand, sun. How long are we going to be stopped at the checkpoint? And how much time are we actually going to have on the beach? I mean, it feels really strange standing here. I thought that I would only ever see this either by victory of the IRA or indeed by the British defeat in the IRA. I never thought, you know, that I would stand here and I wouldn't see any personnel and that cars would go through quite freely and that indeed I could stand here and talk ex about exactly what I'm talking about. Right, I'm standing here and I'm in the north and if you can see that tree just down there on the left, that isn't Donegal. That is like the south of Ireland. Um, so you're not talking about you're not talking about much of a of a distance. 
for uh, a whole atmosphere to change, for things to become more relaxed. You know, people will travel to Donegal purely because uh, the south of Ireland has seen to be completely different and, and what you're talking about is a few kilometres. So you're, um, you know, pe people look at the south of Ireland and think, oh look how peaceful it is, how green it is, how beautiful it is. And they look at the north and all they see these armoured cars and lookout posts and watchtowers. And indeed this checkpoint, this, this is part of the north, it's not part of the south. There has been widespread condemnation of the release from Wakefield Prison of paratrooper Lee Clegg. Throughout areas of the north, there have been protests and in some areas, serious rioting. Sinn Féin politicians have described the release of paratrooper Lee Clegg as an act of arrogance, but have called for calm in nationalist areas. Well, the ceasefire is nearly a year old now, and if you ask me what I want now, at the end of it all, it's all over, it would be a United Ireland, because that's what Pop died for. In the last 12 months, many things have, have happened, but I think the most important thing that has happened is that the conditions now exist, that if people bear up their responsibilities, then perhaps we can see a lasting peace in Ireland. Uh, as I look at my own personal life in the last year, I have been released from prison, I've got married and my wife Rose is expecting a child. So I look to my own personal future with a degree of optimism. Unfortunately, there is a, a sort of niggling doubt and it grows that perhaps the British won't live up their responsibilities and the mistakes made in the past 25 years may be repeated. Twelve months ago when the IRA announced their ceasefire, my first thought was, well, are Britain going to go into this genuine or are they just going to take this as an opportunity for victory over the IRA? And as the time went on and you were waiting for things like all party political talks, the release of political prisoners, who they're now saying don't exist, there are no uh, political prisoners on this island. Um, and then you have things like Lee Clegg, a convicted paratrooper, convicted of murder in Belfast, released from, re released from his life sentence and back in the paratroopers. It makes you think, well, was I wrong to mistrust the British? As, as we approach the first anniversary of, of the IRA cessation, then uh, it's certainly a case that the enthusiasm and, and the energy, the good will of last August has, has very quickly evaporated. We have, uh, we have seen 11 months of extremely hard work by the leadership of Sinn Féin to attempt to engage all, all the other parties, uh, Irish, British, American, European, to engage in uh, all party dialogue to uh, seek a solution to, to the Irish problem. All that hard work, all that energy and all that enthusiasm doesn't seem to have come to too much. The response from the other parties has varied from mediocre to downright negative from the British. And the events of the last few months, uh, the marching season, the release of Clegg, the uh, failure to respond to any of the demands of, of the nationalist people has just compounded that negativity. And as we approach this first anniversary, things do not augur well for the peace process. Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams has called for all those concerned about peace in Ireland to try and move the peace process out of the present crisis. The least we could do is make the world a better place. Not just for a few. But all the human race To end wars and quarrels Make John Lennon's dream come true To build a new set of morals It's the least we could do Show some love 
love and compassion When people are feeling low Make it not just a fashion That may come and go A peace for all mankind It's the least that we could do